the panel discussion and followed by a reception on the occasion of the publication of the book of Nadia Urbanati, mm -hmm. Democracy Disfigured. I was going to do that, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy Disfigured. It cannot be done that too often. It cannot be done too often, I agree. And uh, we are going to have a, a presentations from four of our colleagues and then open it and response from Nadia and then open it to, to discussion. I will introduce everyone. I want to say that this is a joint event on, with the Institute of Religion, Culture and Public Life, uh, the Lincoln European Institute and the Heyman Center for the Humanities where we are located. So uh, a co-sponsored event. We will start with comments by Vicky Murillo, so I will start introducing everyone from uh, that side on. Vicky uh, Murillo is a professor in the Department of Political Science and the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia University. She is the author of uh, Labor Unions, Partisan Coalitions and Market Reforms in Latin America, one of her books, and the other one uh, political competition, partisanship, and policy making in the reform of Latin American public utilities. Then we have Professor Federico Finkelstein, Finkelstein? Okay. who is an associate professor of history at uh, the New School for Social Research and the director of the Janey program in Latin American Studies. He is the author of many books on fascism, the Holocaust, and Jewish history in Latin America and Europe. His latest book is uh, called Transatlantic Fascism. Uh, we went to the same high school. <laughs> he important fact, they went to the same high school, so watch out well, for what they the public, one they more. Watch out for what they say to see if there is the influence of the high school still. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Maria Pia Lara, who is a professor of philosophy at the University Autonoma Metropolitana, Mexico, and visiting uh, scholar at the Department of Philosophy at the New School. She is the author of The Disclosure of Politics, Struggles over the Semantics of Secularization and narrati Narrating Evil a post-metaphysical theory of reflective judgment. Uh, last but not least, oh, we have actually Nadia too, so really, <laughs> 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 I forgot, sorry, uh, is uh, Ira Ketz-Nelson, Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University, and actually the president, the current president of the SSRC, here in New York. His most recent books are Fear Itself, The New Deal, and The Origins of Our Times, which just now, last week, got the Bancroft Award, so congratulations again. Um, and then, uh, when affirmative action was white, an untold history of racial inequality in 20th century America. And finally, again, but not least, Nadia Urbanati, who is the author of our book and is professor in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University here, and is the recipient of the very distinguished uh, Lanfest Faculty Award. She is the author of many books, Representative Democracy, Principles and Genealogy, one of them, Mill on Democracy from Athenian Polis to representative government in addition to uh, democracy disfigured that we are going to discuss today. Uh, I'm going to uh, sit in the background here, but I think you each get 10 minutes for comments, and then Nadia responds, and then we open it to, to discussion. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for doing that. Thank you. So shall I start? Thanks a lot for the invitation, although I'm not by any chance a, a theorist, I'm an empirical political scientist, and I had the chance of reading this fantastic book that I recommend, so please, one more. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit from my standpoint of view, which is from, from an empirical, as a political, empirical political scientist. And I thought that Nadia provides a great uh, argument uh, for defending procedural democracy as someone who studies Latin America and really value this. She emphasized two threats to democracy that might constitute these disfigured democracies that are particularly important in the Latin American experience. One is economic inequality, and the second is the concentration of the media. So I'm going to uh, use these two in, in trying to make my comments, uh, and, and based on the experience of the region. The first comment I have is on political equality, and political, equal political liberty. And this idea that this requires also positive uh, freedom of speech, not just negative freedom of speech. And here, a point that I wanted to, you know, Nadia to comment more is that the two sides, and these are two very polarized sides, claim that they are defending freedom of speech for democracy, and they have very different proposals in this definition. So I wanted you, that was one comment. The second comment is more on, on your idea of communication. And, and I think, you know, having the Italian experience and Berlusconi in your mind, most of the discussion is centered on the media, obviously. But I was, I was thinking that you could talk more about the role of, of personalized forms of communication, of uh, the role of networks, religious, um, ethnic partisan neighborhoods. And, and networks are very important for, for empirical political science in the study of American politics. Networks can fragment public opinion, but there's a lot of debate that responsiveness is to these individual citizens that chat with each other. That is not the, 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 the way you discuss it is individual public opinion, but that's not how it happens empirically. A lot of the times we chat with your neighbor, you chat with your friends, some people form public opinion, but not as a political action in an everyday discussion. And that's not part uh, of, of the discussion currently. And that also might generate tensions with individual uh, public op individual opinions, in the sense that you might segregate yourself. It might generate threats of others by self-segregation, generate polarization. We see that in the, in the American context very much. Um, but also might make politicians responsive to certain groups and not to others. So your idea of majority <laughs> is, you know, is thinking about the median voter. But that's not, politicians are not always responsive to the median voter. Sometimes they're responsive to core voters. So how that uh, talk to your, your discussion of democracy is something that I would really love to, to hear about. And the other way in which these personal networks are important is in, in the discussion of populism. Um, as a Latin American, I spent a great deal of time looking at, at populism. And, and, and I agree with you that the narrative of populism has this kind of mass homogeneity. But the reality of populism is very heterogeneous. So these networks and different functional categories really ge generate a lot of diversity within the Latin American populist movements, which are very different from the Europeans. I also want to talk a little bit to the to the different expressions. So it's true that polarization, you say polarization establishes identity and generates hostility to the mechanism of representation in the name of the one collective affirmation of the will of the electors or the people and bring this, I thought it was fantastic, this idea that only in English people is, it's a plural word, it's true, popolo, pueblo, vol. I mean, it's always a singular uh, uh, collective word. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that, that brings the intolerance for dissent, the impatience with institutions. But uh, in the Latin American experience, there is, uh, I think, more to it. There is a call for direct democracy, for referendums, for recalls, for participation, even for multicultural rights. If you look at the current populist experience in the region, they really call for the rights of the indigenous people, for the right even of you know, different uh, gender options. Um, so it's much less xenophobic than the European version. Um, and, and what the Latin American populist had, both in its classical version and its in cont contemporary version, or, although I'm, I'm sure Federico will disagree here, is that it legitimacy is certainly not based on procedures, based on outcomes, but outcomes that involve redistribution, yes. material and symbolic redistribution. So the impatience with institution needs to be understood in the sense of a polarization against an elite that you don't want to react. So we're trying to get them before they get at us. 
And part of the legitimacy that this narrative encounter is because the other side also polarized. And I was, I, I was looking at, you know, the, of course, I went back to Peronism in part because I think like Lacroix made a category here of Peronism, uh, if that is possible. But, you know, when Eva Peron got cancer, people write long life to cancer on the, on the streets. I mean, when Peron was deposed, there was a decree that says any person who leaves images or status of the deposed dictator and his consort in public view uses the words such as Peronism or third positions, abbreviations such as Peronist Party, blah, 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 you know, will be sentenced to prison terms. So, I mean, the polarization was on both sides. And the way, you know, you read the book, you look at polarization from one side and you don't see the other side in, in, the, in, the, in the experience. And I think that's, that anti, the anti-elite component of the Latin American populism really gets reinforced by the elite reaction to populism. And in that sense, the Latin American experience of populism is different from the European. That's more kind of recognition. On it. In, in Latin America, populism is the politics of abundance. In Europe, it's the politics of scarcity. We don't have anything to redistribute, so we redistribute status. We redistribute, you know, we are whatever is the ethnicity, the nation, and, and discard the others. But I think that gives us a very different flavor to the narrative uh, in the book, and I would really want to hear what you have to say on those remarks. So I think I did my 10 minutes or less. Um, well, actually, we agree. I mean, on that point, Peronism and redistribution. And uh, I mean, if anyway, I will return to that because it's sort of part of my. I mean, what I have to say. I mean, obviously, I I am very biased uh, here speaking as an historian, but also an historian of those who generally are against democracy. So, um, so I'm all the time. I mean, I, this is a fantastic book. One book that I, that I a book that I really learned from, and uh, and I was asking. All the time, this kind of very uh, egotistical question: What does it say about dictatorship? And it's a, it's a, it's a, and, and that is, I mean, that kind of, in a way, uh, uh, combing the book against that kind of uh, brush really illuminates what democracy is. And, and I think there is a lot to be said that. So about that, and that is, I mean, something that that I believe is, is sometimes implicit. So I will return to this point, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, about dictatorship um, as well. Uh, now, I mean, the book, uh, for an historian at least, it, it provides a, 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 an incredible, a very powerful combination of uh, critical, I mean, critical theory, a, a theory that is, that is self-reflective, as well as an intellectual history of all these concepts. So I really felt that this reading this book, uh, I have to say, again, for my own narcissistic reasons. But also, uh, uh, there is something which is interesting to, I mean, to, in a way, uh, perhaps juxtapose to how, I mean, history understands itself, which is this idea of a democracy as a procedure, and this is instance on the procedure, and it's something that historians of the time insist, because basically we are, I mean, at least explicitly, we want to say that we are somehow a, a, all the time mediating between our own normative values and, and, the, and the subject of the study. And yet uh, you insist that, 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 that uh, the, I mean, procedural democracy is, is, uh, it is in itself a normative take on what democracy is. So, I mean, that is also something that for me opened uh, a lot of questions regarding, I mean, how uh, as historians we, have, we approach democracy. Um, so another point that I would like to make, I mean, these are just, I mean, I'm sharing with you my impressions as a, as a reader, uh, and basically an, an, an another point that I would like to make is that uh, the book is very important, uh, particularly for historians, but also more specifically for historians of Latin America, because of its very powerful and, 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 and novel critique of, the, of epistemic notions of democracy, and specifically the work of Rosan Ballon. Because it is, it, it, that work, which is uh, which is extremely important, has been canonized, and suddenly this is a, it becomes the norm about democracy itself. And 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 I and I have to say, even if I consider myself to be ambivalent after reading your book, I am less ambivalent towards a procedural understanding of democracy. Because of course, it's an issue of as a citizen now, not as an historian of faith. And, and you know, I would like to be convinced by Rosan Ballon. Uh, but but basically, you make a, a I mean a, a, a very a, a very strong case about uh, how that perhaps leads to I mean perhaps I would say I was reading it that way perhaps to a more dictatorial or totalitarian understanding of it and and something that I wanted to ask is about the specific French context uh, of that of that notion of the people that he's all the time contextualizing and criticizing but at the same time he's impersonating. Uh, 
when he when he provides this, this normative take on what I mean, what are or should be the outcomes of democracy? And as as as, and as, as Professor Vignati uh, demonstrates, that all the time, in a way, uh, leads to a uh, disfiguration of, of, of what democracy is. So for me, that was really both challenging and, 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 and extremely convincing. Uh, even I have to say, perhaps I'm more of a convert into the procedural view that you put forward after reading this, this book. Now, in terms of, I mean, another really uh, uh, polemic and powerful and, to me, definitely convincing argument is uh, the criticize of, of, of the tradition of reading populism um, in the way that Laclau does. And what is important about Laclau is not only that, that, uh, that, I mean, that he, I mean, perhaps the innovation is that he likes it, I mean, this normative take on populism, but as basically Professor Rinati demonstrates how, I mean, the understanding of populism that he provides is very conventional, and it's rooted in a, in a, in a share in a, in a share take on what populism is, shared by people that are against or, or in favor of it. So, I, I mean, to me that was, that, well, that was really interesting, because in a way it's bringing back Laclau to the place that is, uh, that is uh, where he's rooted, rather than buying the argument that, 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 that is a kind of transcendence after the publication of his book, meaning that all the works on populism are one thing, and now he provides an understanding of the political as such, as populism. So for me that was very, very important, and I wanted to mention. Now, um, this is a critique and, uh, that is framed in the, uh, in the context of broader disfigurations of democracy, as Professor Rubinati understands them. And, and, they, I mean, and this encompasses, uh, of course, other aspects of the book that I will just mention in passing, which are, of course, uh, a place visitory notion and the epistemic notion of, of, of democracy that I, that, I, that I mentioned before. But what is interesting is that, if, 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 the, 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 that Professor Rubinati suggests that one could read and perhaps even integrate the three dimensions, that, that in practice, or in history, uh, these things are much more, uh, are, are in, a, in a constant interplay. Because, I mean, there is a way to read even populism uh, as, uh, in, in terms of the different cases through these plebiscitarian notions. And even to some extent, there is the leader claiming that he or she knows, and, and it's an epistemic notion of what democracy is. So, I mean, to me, that was also very challenging uh, to, I mean, and I was thinking again and again how to think about the cases that I'm interested in uh, for my own narcissistic reasons, which are peroni, peronism in particular. And finally, there is the issue of Latin America, and, and, and I agree uh, with Vicky uh, uh, in terms of the differences. And in, in Europe, uh, the understanding of the people leads to a xenophobia in a way that, that in Latin, Latin America does not. And in Latin America, the enemy, I mean, is much more flexible. And as, as, a, as intolerant of pluralism as it is, it is very open to accept again and again those who were enemies but can be converted into friends. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the notion of the people is, is very... Uh, um, Perhaps, well, it's more open, and yet it, it's, it shares, I mean, the populist route that you present, I mean, with the European cases. Uh, and one interesting thing is uh, what is going on now in Italy, or more specifically in the Vatican, because, I mean, what, what we have, I mean, is a, is a, a Peronist Pope, or a populist Pope, a, Peronist, I mean, a person that speaks for the people. I mean, that basically the notion of, I mean, in, in my classes, I always signal the Vatican as one of the cases in, in, in you know, in, 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 as one more political system that is not that modern. Basically, that its legitimacy is rooted, is rooted in an in a older notion of sovereignty. And yet, you have this guy now trying to mix, mix things up and somehow provide a sort of legitimate legitimacy that is not only rooted in the divine, but now rooted in the people. And by the way, he was always a Peronist. I mean, he was a militant Peronist, I mean, in of the, the right, uh, in Guardia de Rey, the Arrow, an extreme right organization in the, in, the, in the 1960s and 70s. And it's very interesting to see how, in, in a way, populism has reached the Vatican. And, and, uh, and, uh, the global. Sorry? <laughs> the global. Is it, is it, yes. So, and the, and the question that perhaps I wanted to ask in relation to that is how this plays into religion. Because I was thinking about this idea of forming groups of... Well, this of, is uh, a gene. Okay. This is so, a gene quality. So perhaps she... Religion. Uh, and finally, finally, uh, there is a question of populism and fascism. Uh, and, 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 and in that regard, how this relates to dictatorship. And my question was about uh, how, I mean, this understanding of... Uh, because basically at one point you say populism is not revolutionary. And yet you finish the chapter of populism by saying that it might lead to regime change. That it has a potentiality for totalitarianism or, or dictatorship. And, and I wanted to ask you... I mean, about that, because dictatorship in itself 
So has generally has had a flexibilitarian notion. So for example, I mean, uh, the Latin American dictatorships that I study, the Argentine dictatorships, I mean, they are speaking for the people. They are there for the people. Although they are not, they are not in, in, into the uh, mathemat electoral uh, mathematics that, that the populist regime still recognizes. So anyway, I will stop there. Thank you. So um, in order to be really fast, I, I don't know if I I always thought that the, the, the two people who were before me would explain a little bit about the book, since they haven't explained anything really about the, the <laughs> concepts of the book. Please allow me to say no, something about it. Uh, Nadia well, Urbinati's book on democracy disfigured, uh, democracy disfigured, is a brave attempt to cope with the problems of modern and institutional democracies. It is also a welcome critical effort because he has to consider not only the conservative views who are clearly against democracy, like Carl Schmitt, for example, but also from those who want to defend the democracy by transforming it. From the start, we see that Urbinati's main goal is to insist on a very strict definition of democracy as a diarchy. Quote, diarchy, she says, of will and opinion applies in particular to representative democracy, a system in which an assembly of elected representatives, rather than the city, citizens directly, is endowed with the ordinary function of making the laws. This is on page 22. Thus, we might say that she pursues this critical agenda against those theorists who think they can save democracy by radicalizing it, while she insists that the concept of democracy as a diarchy should remain untouched. I have problems with this claim, but I must say I don't disagree with her diagnosis. First, why I agree that she targets with good reasons those authors who represent Platonism, and Platonism she calls those um, specialists uh, that supposedly would take the leading uh, as government because they know more, because they they become king philosophers in the sense that they are the ones who really know the reality and, and they can lead the, the country well. That, that's a well-found uh, way of calling them. Then the populists, um, that my two uh, previous uh, colleagues have talked about, and the third figure is the play visits, um, which is really related a lot related to, to, the, to the populist party. But this is about uh, when the leader, uh, what he wants is to have just the uh, uh, willing, passionate uh, um, acceptance of a form of government. There is nothing but uh, the theatrical, she calls it aesthetic uh, sort of uh, representation in uh, the empowerment of, of the summit. So I think uh, there must be, um, so I agree with this, uh, that, that these are three really spectacular problems for um, <coughs> democracy, but I think there must be room for nuances. And it is um, important to focus on empirical examples. I'm glad that I, um, my two previous colleagues have uh, dedicated a lot to uh, Latin America, but Europe, in fact, is what seems to me really the, uh, the warring diagram of, uh, of Nadia's concerns. Um, and you see why. Um, Platonism, it seems to me, has been the hallmark of the political project of the European Union. This project was built by experts, philosophers and professional politicians, and ran into a big failure. On the one side, the institutional European discourse did not connect to the local citizens. On the other hand, the citizens' skepticism against the idea of a united Europe did not allow them to conceive of themselves out of the post brustalian notion of the nation-state. In the past, the interactive work was constructed by, so, by the social movements and their experiences from the two world wars were at the back of these efforts. In the 70s, the disappearance of the welfare state came along with the capitulation of real civil societies. The authentic, conceptual, and political conservative revolution was done by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the United States, both destroyed the structural barriers of the welfare state for capitalism to run without borders. In the same manner, the politicians of the left stopped 
seeing themselves as an alternative to conservative governments and focus more on how to stay in power. So the problem for me are the actors of the left, not the authors of the left. And they were successful the more they moved their positions to follow an even more radical, conservative political agenda. It was due to these efforts that the name of globalization became a defining momentum. The deregulation of the capital, the flux of it, and the ideological consensus of neoliberal theories were the grounds of the actual Europe. This was the platonic place where experts were called, technocrats were elected, and philosophers wrote about cosmopolitanism. The myth of capitalism being the source of liberty and the consumer as being the new autonomous being were the results of these events. The economical crisis of 2007 changed this perspective. The new social movements have not been able to articulate a political agenda with concrete goals in institutional and democratic terms. The <coughs> outraged citizenship, even though they are entirely justified, has not been translated into views that consider eman emancipation and justice as related to democracy. The cosmopolitan momentum failed because it could not generate practical ways in which to construct a collective imaginary with pro a progressive view, something like the one that articulated the reconstruction of the European countries after the Second World War. Thus, the deficit in progressive theories and the radical crisis of the liberal institutions that, are co uh, that we are confronting now is it with a new kind of social actors who profoundly resent the consequences of the destruction of the welfare state, just as they are against their regulation of the market. Furthermore, they also resent the real lack of representation from the political elites. The consequences, the consequences of all of these problems are that these societies have fallen prey to populist leaders, like in the Netherlands. They have massively closed themselves to renewals of immigration and generosity, like the example of the plebiscitarian Switzerland, England, France, and Italy. They lack the capacity even to elect a government, like in Belgium, and they have fall fallen prey to the worst kind of corruption, the political prime minister and actor in Italy, <clears throat> who devoured all criticism and defeated completely the opposition. Where is the left in all this? Looking at this devastating landscape, one can only see why Rinat is worried sick with what's going on in Europe. Unfortunately, those Platonist, populist, and plebiscite thinkers are only the proofs that what is at stake here is the crisis of the concept of representation altogether. It might be due less to the effort of these theorists than to the lack of <coughs> emancipative goals from political actors from the left, and the terrible, unquestioned success of the worst kind of conservatism. <coughs> the cases of Latin America countries obey a different sort of elements, those that have already mentioned, first colleague. Uh, first, many countries there have suffered terribly military repression, murder, murders, and oppression. Very often, the institutional church and the military sport together. Each country has its own problems. By 1989, however, the authoritarian governments were self-defeated and democracy as a political goal became the political scenario. There, contrary to the Europeans who are disenchanted with democracy, the Latin Americans saw democracy as a new horizon of expectations. Their arrival to this stage was not clear cut, nor was it exempted from terrible contradictions and even retrograde historical moments. It is true that here, the Platonists are not the strong group, even though at some point they wanted to be. But the populists and the plebiscitarians are. We cannot put them all in one bag, since each country has gained something, and they, they, their struggles against, they have struggled against specific problems. Argentina has, Argentina has little similarities with Venezuela, and Brazil is not like Peru. One must consider, however, that in many of these countries, racism is one of the most difficult legacies from colonization, and very often, class and race are aligned. Therefore, the populism brought the possibility 
to make visible those who were invisible for centuries. This might be the biggest success of Chavez's government, though it is clear that it has produced other problems that are very well described by Nadia in her book. These effects in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela have made the public sphere an important site of visibility. These groups have an alternative ideas about democracy, and they might be different than the ones that even Nadia contemplated. Sometimes they might seem to be reflecting the social imaginary of the nation state that Anderson wrote about, but often, more often than not, they also have shown more imaginative local perspectives, and their political agendas have been included in the populist regimes of Morales, Dilma Rousseff, or Chavez. Remember that moment of Dilma Rousseff coming out and saying, all of these problems you want to discuss them, then let's get together and discuss the Constitution. Remember that last week? One cannot ignore the problems of corruption, the antagonisms that erode plurality, or the vestige of clientelism. From this perspective, the two most conservative countries, Mexico and Colombia, are the ones that I find in the world situation, but they are not populist or authoritarian. <coughs> and this is something we should consider. The problem there, uh, Colombia is at least a democratic country, while Mexico is far from being one. The histories of Latin America are packed with tragedies and great social differences, <coughs> class and ethnicity. Many of those countries have authoritarian <coughs> pasts and some even genocidal ones. In others, like our country, corruption and narco-politics have eroded the democratic hopes of citizens. In spite of all these problems, the political agenda there is framed under the expectations that are provided by the term democracy. The governments of those countries have been opposed to capitalist groups and the IMF. These kind of examples are opening up to new social imaginaries. What these realities attest is that it is not possible to consider all these figurations negative. Political concepts are sites of struggles. Democracy as a concept has not its own history, but histories. And while some vestiges of this meaning are still included in our present understanding of the term, as Urbinati, Urbinati often shows, the term democracy has acquired different meanings since the concept of popular sovereignty first appeared. This space of opinion was also the one that allowed political actors to see themselves as being capable of doing something more than just obeying after the French Revolution. The critical consideration to debate here then, it would be if we could stick to the kind of liberal definition that would be not this concept of democracy as opposes. From her book and the examples I have given, one can almost say that it will not remain uncontested. The European political actors do not see themselves well represented in their democracies well, Latin American populist governments have given visibility to new social actors, but have not solved the question of pluralism and antagonisms. I rather think that, as Urbinati argues almost at the end of the book, democracy, since it has no utopia to deliver, it is the space for conflict, even in its definition, for concepts, even in, in, in its definition, would be a never-ending story for concepts are also vehicles of action. Thank you. The analysis I propose, she writes, pivots on the idea of democracy as a government by means of opinion. That's probably the single most important sentence in the book. Um, in particular, I shall explain, it relies on the premise that representative democracy is a diarchic system in which will, by which I mean the right to vote, and the procedures and institutions that regulate the making of authoritative decisions and opinion, by which I mean the extra-institutional domain of political opinions, influence and each, other, each other and cooperate without merging. Um, now that is not just a definition of democracy, it is a normative statement that is defended against three disfigurements in this book. And the three disfigurements are not, um, in empirical terms, on quite equal planes, but they all have theoretical underpinnings. One of them is um, a kind of apolitical deliberation, a fascination 
with uh, bypassing um, the plurality of opinion and bypassing ordinary procedures in favor of creating zones of deliberation above and beyond politics. The second disfigurement uh, treated in this book is the disfigurement of populism, about which we've heard a lot. The disfigurement is not Nadia's word. It's not precisely agreed on by, by colleagues. But it is an attempt to construct the people, a unitary the people. Um, it's a strong <coughs> version of popular sovereignty of a very specific kind, which erases um, all kinds of degrees of heterogeneity, uh, tension, um, and um, uh, disagreement um, uh, within a populace. And whether empirically that happens is another question, but that's how it's presented. And the third disfigurement is that of, of plebiscitarianism, which means not just plebiscites as in the state of California voting, but it means a, a particular kind of leadership structure associated with the mass that seeks uh, through um, various passions, as have been said, to mobilize uh, people um, to follow a leader and thus transcend the messiness of ordinary democratic politics. And this is a picture which might be seen as one of antinomies, um, uh, a, a story of the, and the first of each antinomy is the bad and the second is the good, the unitary people or the people as an audience, as in um, uh, the, the plebiscitarian version, versus citizens. Um, truth, the idea that you could discover a singular truth, as in some forms of deliberation, versus a process where the truths are always provisional. That's the, the good. The bad is objective interests. The good is shared preferences. The bad is intolerance. The good is tolerance. The bad is order. The good is messiness. The bad is cynicism. The good is trust. And trust, not in general, but trust of institutions. And to this portrait, um, by the way, with a footnote, I should say, every page is full of gems. If you want to read about um, a critical uh, account of how Ernesto Laclau deals with Gramsci, uh, read it. Um, if you want to distinguish populism from social movements, read this book. It's full of such gems. But the core of it is democracy and its disfigurements in these antinomies. And to this, in the Passover season, I pose four <laughs> questions. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the first question. Um, on the good side of the ledger, a world of citizens, process, um, uh, uh, shared preferences, tolerance, and trust of institutions, where empirically do we see such democracy operating? Um, where do we find the instrumentalities on the, that side of the ledger, um, empirically, factually, and even historically, um, operating in the way that you would normatively desire? Not yet. And I don't mean to say it never does. Um, I, it, the empirical question is not simply where and when do we see such democracy at work, but what are the conditions um, that would make it possible for your uh, normative world in which opinion and procedures interact in this um, uh, recurrent and uh, pr provisional manner um, to continue to be reproduced. Um, second question, also empirical. I found myself wanting to stop reading about, at some point, about Schmidt or Laclau or Roseanne Vallon or other people who were well worth spending time with and, and to wrestle with empirical instantiations of the three disfigurements. Um, Empirically, I could think a lot more about a plebiscitarianism and populism than about the deliberative mode. The deliberative mode seems to me to be, you know, a, a dear colleague like Jim Fishkin invites the, it, it invents deliberative assemblies. But where in the world do we actually have um, a kind of what Jenny Mansbridge called a friendship model of deliberation actually occurring? Um, small town New England um, uh, or uh, 
in, in the Mansbridge example of her wonderful book, Beyond Adversary Democracy, a, a, a rape counseling group in, in Boston. But in terms of the big polities, um, uh, the disfigurement of deliberation seems to me to be more in the imagination of political theorists than in the world. That's the question. Um, we can talk, I'd love to know if we can talk about that. But where do we find it? Um, and under what conditions? And populism, um, which instantiations uh, are disfigurements of democracy and which instantiations are not democracy at all? Um, that is, when do we cross the border? And the same especially with the plebiscitarian um, instance. I was trying to think, or try to, and I, I failed to think, it's my failure, to think of instances that you would label um, uh, plebiscitarian that don't cross the boundary of, um, of democracy, that move outside of it, or at least certainly outside of your definition of what democracy is. So is there some kind of zone, a liminal zone, that is not quite democratic and not quite anti-democratic in which these three disfigurements occur. And in that sense, is it democracy disfigured um, or is it democracy transcended, opposed, um, rejected, um, uh, uh, and so on? Third question. Um, if, if we have these disfigurements, um, what combinations of structures and experiences are most likely to fashion them. Um, uh, what is the? Is there a causal story that is possible to tell? Um, what economic or social or political or institutional conditions change the probabilities that, um, with respect to the existence of these three disfigurements of um, uh, 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 of, of, of democracy? They're presented with uncommon depth and richness, riveting richness, um, in terms of the structures of these disfigurements and their relationship to key thinkers who instantiate or represent them. Um, but there's less about the causal conditions that would make one or another appear and appear in different ways in different in different uh, places. Um, what is, why is there a shift in the dispositions of thinkers, leaders, citizens in a democracy, in <coughs> settled democracies, that in which opinion and um, institutions interact? Why is there a shift in dispositions toward a plebiscitarianism, toward populism, toward um, deliberation? Um, and further, just a footnote to that third question is, it, it, is there something about democracy and its anxieties today, as opposed to some other period, um, that distinctively points in those directions? Um, or are there um, moments, historical moments or cycles, like the interwar period of the 20th century and the present, that you wish to tell us um, have homologous qualities um, that lead to these dangers for democracy? And the final question is, um, how would you like your readers to think about the relationship of your analysis to a literature which um, I don't think is present here, but is a kind of mid-20th century empirical behavioral literature on American democracy? And I thought of one book in particular, David Truman's Governmental Process, 1951. I don't know how many people have read The Heyday of Pluralist Analysis. And what does David Truman tell us? He tells us that interests are subjective and not objective, that there's no such thing as a unitary public interest, that what really counts in democracy are the rules of the game, not a particular substantive truth outcome. And what matters is that we be aware that any polity can experience what he called, in a very dramatic language, morbific politics, sick politics. Um, and you, you give three examples of sickness in democracy. Is this David Truman revisited in the form of a democratic theorist of the early 21st century? And one last example, um, a person whom you wouldn't ordinarily, um, I don't ordinarily, 
think of as a democratic theorist, though an incredibly smart person, the late Samuel Huntington, whose book on political order and changing societies had a famous set of relationships. And one of the key was the, 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 the numerator in a, and, and a denominator. The numerator was participation. The denominator was institutionalization. And he argued that when participation, populist participation, plebiscitarian participation, outrun thick institutionalization, you get disorder. Um, and he wanted, it wasn't, a, he was a theorist of stability, not a theorist of democracy. But the logic of your presentation and the logic of Huntington's seem to me to have um, a great deal in common. That's not <laughs> <laughs> and this is not this is not this is not criticism. Um, I think that that ratio of, of participation institutionalization can be put to many purposes, not just Huntington's, including positively the purpose of deepening and reviving and instantiating democratic theory, which is the purpose of this book, and was not Sam Huntington's purpose. But the logic of the relationship of participation and institutionalization struck me as um, close, just as the relationship to the work of David Truman seemed close. And this would be counterintuitive for a radical or a democratic theorist. And I was curious to know how you thought about that. <laughs> And so I started asking myself, uh, what's happened here? Can we uh, have, do we have instruments in theory or democracy, uh, theoretical point of view of democracy at least, to interpret this change uh, and this new reality? We know that democracy is, uh, is uh, that and that, that. We have a yes or no position, either democracy or not. But what if democracy internally changes? How can we? Uh, how can we recognize it? How, what kind of names we can define, or we can use in order to define it? So, now, <laughs> Aristotle has in politics a, a fantastic definition of democracy, which is not a definition, it's a, it's a depiction of democracy. It doesn't give strong definition, in fact. It's a depiction, like a picture indeed, of democracy that starts from a moment of constitutional definition. Constitutional entity called the politia, which is what we have, basically. And then it goes through an analysis because of the social transformation, class organization that changes, impoverishment or uh, strong class division that uh, emerges. So then this democracy has different internal variations from the constitutional down to the demagogical which is the equivalent of the topic, basically. So after that is another story. After that, you have a dictatorial system that is abolition of basic rights and political equality and liberty and so on and so forth. So this is the entire spectrum. And within this entire spectrum, you recognize this is, demo this is democracy, although it's more populistic, although it's pre-vegetarian, although it's based on... Uh, experts. Today the idea of uh, using politics in order to uh, reach uh, truth is so fashionable, I have to say. It's not, uh, it's not marginal. It's a real issue, the question of uh, in, in competence through political uh, procedures, as if procedures are defined or designed in order to reach an outcome. So I would like, uh, that is the basic point. So how can uh, I, I and with that, how to solve this. So you need to perhaps to define or to have this basic definition of democracy, basic, basic picture of uh, this body called democracy with the contour, uh, contours that are not so thick. Otherwise, uh, all these distinctions disappear. Or uh, they are something else, they are another regime. So, but you, they are inside of this, this regime because these elections, because they use the press, because they use uh, they don't send to jail people, not at least, uh, not now. They don't uh, expel them from the public sphere, although they manipulate their vo voice to, so that their voice are completely uh, impossible to hear, or uh, they are uh, heard in a different uh, uh, discretionary way. So, still is democracy. So, it, uh, so this democracy is this diarchy. This diarchy for me is an important 
starting point. It's a certain, you can recognize it in Bob, you recognize it in Dahl, you can recognize it in many other authors. It's not something, uh, I don't invent anything. Habermas has beautifully defined it in a clear way, uh, even if uh, with uh, perhaps too many words, but it's, <laughs> very, it's very clear. You can extract from it this dual moment. Now, this equilibrium between the dual moment is the most difficult stuff. And in some sense, democracy is like a work of art, because it's a permanent attempt to rebalance the two, with a fantastic ability, it's the only system, perhaps, uh, democracy that is able to do so, in a permanent attempt to redefine this, this uh, relationship between institutions and rules, and between what is outside, uh, which is expressed in different ways, from movements to parties to opinions, in a pluralistic way. Now, What's happening today, according to me, is not the relevance of the institutional side, which more or less we agree is the same. You can have a presidential system versus a parliamentary system, but above all is the same. According to me, all the transformations are very problematic. One sometimes uh, emerges in the other side of the story, the opinion formation. Opinion formation because, and this is the, the first chapter, because one, the introduction of private money in public organization of opinion formation. So the question of public money, private money, sorry, private money and uh, class organization that is much stronger now than in the past, the increase of inequality in economic and social life, and thus the potential for some citizens to have much more an organized voice than other citizens is a real issue. We cannot uh, escape from that. It's something that is going to change dramatically our democracies. I don't know in which way, but it's a real fact. Now, until now, and this is perhaps an answer to the question by Vicky at the beginning, until now we have uh, thought that uh, freedom of speech in a negative sense is enough. It was enough, because freedom of speech has the negative rights against power has been the quintessential founding moment of creation of constitutional regime. Right. The question is that uh, speech creates power, because it creates an opinion that creates uh, as an influence in institutions through uh, representation and so on and so forth. And today, this power is an object of um, um, flirting and admiration and, and, and acquisition by some who had who has more economic power than others. This is clear. It's, it's evident wherever you go. Uh, so that uh, our democracy is changing. It's precisely perhaps a democracy in which people are witnessing, are seeing, uh, are watching a, a, a spectacle that somebody uh, is playing. Um, the question of the public as a eye, a big eye that analyzes and seeing and, and judges and enjoys and you know, but this is a new notion of citizenship that is going to change because of the change in the world of opinion. And so this is, for me, it's, a, uh, it's the starting point that I, I wanted to. Now, in order to develop that, I try to see how this opinion uh, in the world of opinion change can produce different outcomes. One is the epistemic one. The epistemic one, it's, uh, it perhaps it's not only theoretical, because there is the sense that uh, democracies, parliaments, assemblies are not good enough anymore to make quick, fast, competent decisions. We want experts, we want, because procedures are supposed to make us solving problems, and you know, uh, technicians is much better to solve a problem of ingenieristic case, of ingenieristic case than an ordinary citizen. So ordinary citizens are shut down from, uh, or off, I'm sorry, from this uh, uh, epistemic, necessarily. And unfortunately, within the theory of democracy, there is this uh, germ of epistemic, epistemic uh, deviation. Uh, so one may, ask, uh, one may ask even, and this could be a, a topic for a larger book, or a larger search, can we have a democratic theory? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real question. Democracy is a practice. To make it into, into theory may create some problems in, the, in this case, at least. 
So I become more and more skeptical on this, uh, precisely because this epistemic Platonist at, uh, attempt to um, manipulate the notion of opinion, transforming the opinion into a question of truth and force, uh, it's uh, something that takes away from us uh, what we have, because opinion is a sign of liberty. It is a sign of, uh, it's a sign of political freedom of participation. Whatever, whatever, we, whatever we think and we want, and without any kind of uh, coercive uh, imposition of a true search. So this is very important. It's democracy. It has to do with politics and with political freedom. Nothing else. Nothing else. Democracy doesn't promise us no eternal life, no utopia, no a better society, not even a kind of good decisions. Because it's not possible to do that. Democracy promises us that different as we are in, in many things, sometimes even unequal as we are, we are nonetheless equal in our saying in the public as citizens. So that, that is for me the, the strength of this, uh, of this uh, uh, idea. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, a system not necessarily well functioning. It produces bad decisions. Sometimes the laws are unbearable. How is possible to have loads that, you know, they are so undigestible for many of us, and still they have decisions made. So the decision, the outcome, sometimes is very bad. It's, it's <coughs> un unappetible, unappetible. So this is, it's not here, thus. It's precisely in that, in that cacophonic reality that allows us to be as we are, without any kind of perfectionist pretensions to be something else or better, or even uh, in the true side of the story. So the other two questions, uh, I, I, it's, it's a long story, but I don't want to abuse more than that. Populism and plebiscitarianism, in, in the other sense, are an attempt to square the circle of diarchy in another sense. Not because they eliminate uh, uh, opinion by transforming into a truth exercise, but because they use it in order to impose that opinion in the will that is inside of the institution. Now, it's difficult to say what is populism. We know that. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's impossible to theorize it because it is so based on experience, on how sovereignty was constructed in a specific country, how, it was emancip how the emancipation from colonization was created by military or not, by mm, uh, form, uh, forms of revolutions or uh, kind of uh, other forms of emancipation. So uh, populism is not easily treatable as a category, because it is based on cons uh, contest, uh, the contest very much. So what we wanted to do is to give some lines, some general categories, that you know, they return sometimes. And of course, my mind was not in Latin America, I have to say, it was in Europe, where uh, the transformation of, and of xenophobic populism is a real fact. It's, it's not a question of uh, France only, it's a real problem for the entire world. So populism is there as a permanent possibility because democracy was constructed over nation states and thus over the question of the people as a national unity. Not the people as a simple political category or a legal category, but an ethnic category. So this is there. And finally, plebiscitarianism, which seems to be something old for us, because plebiscitarianism was the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, fascism, Nazi, and so on. Now, there is a new, this new form of plebiscitarianism is visible <coughs> because it has empty squares. You don't see it outside, in the outdoor. Squares are empty. People are no longer in the square. Actually, the public is completely empty in some sense. And yet, there is, through media, television, and even internet, because these niches of identification of um, um, quasi-movements or parties through the net, through the internet, are new form. Also, they help the, to create this form of plebiscitarian identification. So uh, this is a new form of plebiscitarianism that uh, passes through the dismantling of intermediary bodies, Think about the disappearance of parties, of the decline of parties, and uh, the, um, the media says institutions or accredited um, journalist institutions. We do everything by ourselves without any kind of uh, uh, certification about news. About, uh, uh, so there is this kind of personalization of 
creation of opinion on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, identification between the people and the leaders in a, in a new way that is perhaps uh, mm, visual and uh, more than <coughs> active in, in the square as it used to be. So I don't know whether I answer your, all of your questions, but um, anyway, um, I mean, I can. Problem.